can rock that place while praising, clapping your hands, jumping and dancing for the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, oh God. Come on, let's keep on. Clap your hands. For like lightning, I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Sing, I believe. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven.
But wherever, Lord, the brothers and sisters are one watching in their home, in their cars, even outside, wherever they are, Lord, in the bedroom, Lord, in the name of Jesus, make your presence known to them. That your healing power be coming. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Reach them out, oh God. Right now, oh God. Oh Lord, our brothers and sisters who are suffering right now in ever struggles, challenges in their lives, oh God. Anybody, oh Lord, who needs your provisions, right now, oh God. Oh, as we lift up your name, as we glorify your name. that really mean? That some impersonal force galaxies away may consider you from time to time? Or that you are a single drop in a vast ocean of humanity and God cares for all of it? There are billions of lives, billions of stories. Can we really believe he has great destinies planned for all of them? Surely the ruler of the universe has more important affairs than to notice the needs of one singular individual. But hear this, nothing could be further from the truth. When God says, I love you, it means that he crafted every detail of your being. Your every feature is his perfect design. His mind perceives your worries and your thoughts. His heart is broken by your pain. You are his child, created in his image. Your value exceeds all the riches of earth. Your worth extends beyond the stars. And though you may be unaware, he's carefully constructing the events of your life to build his kingdom. If you are willing, he can and will achieve wonders through your hands. It is the deepest passion, the most meaningful promise. It is your security, your hope, and your future. It is the truth beyond doubt. God loves you. Thank you. God bless you. Today is March 14, and we have a new time. And uh, maybe uh, you are still sleepy because you lost one hour. Here in America, we have resumed daylight savings time. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord for everyone who are with us in this worship. And I hope that... Um, you are ready to worship the Lord. You're ready to hear the word of God and continue to share and continue to uh, respond to your, uh, through the comments on your Facebook 
Okay, I will open my mind that I can see your responses. Amen. If you like what I'm saying, just um, like, 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 and type that on the comments. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good morning, then, sa inyong lahat from Japan, from the Philippines, from New York. Amen. Today is the third of the series that we have. Uh, that we have uh, discussing, and uh, this is from Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, which we entitled the title of our series, Heaven's Joy. And uh, this is a parable, actually a series of parables, three parables that Jesus told uh, in Luke chapter 15. And this is about, uh, well, although these are three stories, three parables, but it uh, constitutes only one message, one big idea, and that is how heaven, how God responds when a, when a sinner repents of uh, his sin, and we have seen that uh, heaven is rejoicing. There is celebration in heaven whenever a sinner comes to repentance. So uh, uh, this is the climax, the last, <coughs> which is uh, actually the main uh, story. And the two stories, the, f the lost ship and the lost uh, coin, uh, serves as a prelude to this uh, big story, to this big drama between the father and the prodigal son. Okay, so before that, if you have... Uh, now, actually, this is the third, so if you have not listened to the first two, you can uh, go to our website, okay, www.gracegospelny.org, and over there, you can uh, uh, click on the message. Okay, we, we love Amen. So, uh, if you are, uh, what I'm saying, if you are, uh, if you don't, if you have not listened to the first two sermons, I said that preludes, and uh, we have discussed uh, certain elements in order to uh, pursue to this climax of the story, which is the prodigal son. Okay, um, I will give you a, a little background. <coughs> Jesus, on this particular uh, instance is on his way to Jerusalem and uh, probably he is on the last months before he will offer himself as a sacrifice on the cross so this is uh, just in time as we are in the Lent season uh, 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 looking forward to the sacrifice of the cross and the Holy Week and to his resurrection which is, uh, we celebrate here on the first Sunday of April. So uh, this is the, 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 the transition. Of, of, it means to say he is on his way now to Jerusalem in order to, uh, to offer his life as a sacrifice uh, to the sins of the people. And probably he is already ministering for three years, preaching the gospel, preaching the kingdom of God, preaching repentance and calling people to enter into the kingdom of God through repentance and faith through the Messiah and our Lord. And because of his works, because of his teachings, he developed some enemies, and particularly the Pharisees and the scribes. These are the religious elites. These are the religious people who are supposed to be teaching the people of the law, teaching the people to, be, uh, uh, to repent of their sins and to live in a pure life. So these Pharisees and these scribes thought that they are righteous because of their position as religious leaders. And Jesus often called them hypocrites because they are good in the outside, but their hearts is far away 
from God. So we read it in the beginning verses in verse 1, all the tax gatherers and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. And most of the audience of Jesus Christ during his preaching are what the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are called sinners. They are the tax collectors. And these people are considered religiously unclean. They don't want to be near with them, and they have nothing to do with them. And now Jesus, as we see here, is uh, befriending these people. And to enough, it's because he said openly during his time of preaching that he came to save that which was lost. The sinners, these tax gatherers. So uh, he has, in this particular uh, chapter, in chapter 15, he has two kinds of audiences. So that the Pharisees, the scribes, consider them righteous, consider them as the one who guards the law of God. And he has also the sinners and the tax collectors, the outcasts, the, 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 the people who are on the lowest class of their uh, religious life, which are the unclean. And uh, Jesus, as we see in chapter, in verse two, that welcomes them and he receives them. And this makes these Pharisees and the scribes mad and angry with Jesus because they're following Jesus and you know, not because they like the teaching of Jesus, they follow Jesus and watch Jesus if Jesus will say something that is in conflict with his their tradition and will do something that is not according to their law. So that's why the Pharisees is always around when Jesus is there. So this has set up the scene in Luke chapter 15. Okay, so... We see that uh, in the first story, verses uh, 3 to 7, is a story about a man who finds, who went out to seek his lost sheep. And uh, he said that, uh, uh, that, that the shepherd went out and, and left the 99 who feel themselves righteous and don't need the Savior, so who went out to find and look after the one, the lost sheep. And the second story tells us about a woman who lost a coin. Again, uh, uh, we've we seen that this coin is not really, you know, we may think, you know, what is one out of ten. But uh, as a woman during the time who has no source of income or whatsoever, and many believe that these 10 coins represents her savings. And this was uh, given to her as a dowry, as a gift during her marriage to keep in case uh, of in time of need. And he found out that one coin was lost. And both of these stories we see that after the shepherd found the sheep and after the woman found the lost coin, they call their friends and neighbors in order <coughs> to celebrate. And Jesus concluded that that is what is like in heaven. That God is rejoicing whenever a cedar, a lost, was found. So the third story, which we will discuss today, is about a father who has two sons. So you see the transition, one sheep out of a hundred, one coin out of ten, and one out of two. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I try to find the significance of the one, oh one, but I cannot find it. Nobody can really uh, uh, explain the significance of this illustration. But uh, we see here that, uh, you know, the main point of the story is whenever something is lost, something that is value is lost, it is a rightful thing 
to find me. And everybody during his time, as we see that uh, uh, the ethical issue of the parable, that the two, the rest, the two uh, stories that we have discussed, the Pharisees and even the religious leaders agree. And the people that are listening agree that what the shepherd did is the right thing to do, to look after the lost sheep. Everybody agrees that. That is the right thing because during the time a sheep is valuable animal. Although you know the wool, uh, the skin, the wool, uh, the skin is for their clothing, and throughout the life of a sheep, she will give you know a limited number of wool for them. To, so it's valuable for them, the sheep. So one sheep that is lost, it is a right thing. So. Everybody will agree with that. And then the second story, we see that it is also right thing to do that a woman will find, stop whatever he is doing and, and search for the, last, for the lost coin. It's valuable for her. For her. That is, you know, a uh, life saving for her. This is something that uh, will save her life in times that she will become a widow. And so it is just a right thing. Now in the third story, uh, which is uh, commonly called the parable of the prodigal son, but I think uh, this is not a story about the son, but it is also mainly a story of the father's love to the son who is lost. So, uh, Three, uh, all of the three stories concluded about the main message that whenever one has been found, heaven is rejoicing. Whenever one came home, a prodigal son who came home, the father celebrates, and that is also true in heaven. So, you see, uh, as we have studied that uh, in the understanding of the parable, there are how many layers of the parable? If you remember, let me see in your comment. Nobody's commenting. There are four layers, right? The story, which the but uh, a parable is a is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's not just a story. It has a heavenly meaning. And usually the heavenly meaning is what you dig deeper. And sometimes Jesus will explain the meaning and sometimes uh, it's not. So uh, uh, that's part of understanding the parable. So the first layer is just the, uh, you know, the story, the simple story. Everybody understand. They can identify with that. And... Um, what happened? Are we on? Is it okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, everybody, uh, some of our wires are all over the floor, so whenever somebody step on it. Okay, we're, we're still? All right, amen. Is it not we are dark here because of the light? We're dark. Okay, commercial muna. Like, like, like. <laughs> As uh, our technical crew are uh, uh, busy there. Okay. Um, okay. No light. Yes, we know there's no light. That's why uh, it's dark. Eh? Amen. Okay, so uh, we have light. Amen. Okay. All right, as I am saying, the four layers of the parables. Uh, the first layer is the story. The second layer is the ethical issues. All parables have ethical issues. That people understand what's uh, the, ra that, that the characters. Is it the right thing to do or it is not the right thing to do? But... Uh, the, the, the third layer and the fourth layer is more on the meaning of the parable, the theological and Christological 
uh, uh, layers of uh, the story where Jesus sometimes explained it and sometimes is not. But we can understand it, how it is in the story. Now, uh, the, the third story, the story of the prodigal son, the story of the father and the son is a very uh, uh, beautiful story in, in, in such a way that uh, it, uh, you know, as I'm saying in the first and second story, in the ethical issue, they agree, okay, it is the right thing to do when somebody's lost. Now, in the third story, there's a lot of issues that is common in their days that they expect that what the father should do, okay? And most of that, I believe, that in the minds of the Pharisees, in the minds of the people that are listening during the time, will be amazed or, or they will be shocked. What? The father did that? How, why did he do that? Okay, so it is, it is uh, the thing in this story is not common. It is, should be not the right thing to do as a father during the time. So we will explain that further. Now I divided the story into five, the drama. I, I, I like drama, so this is the drama. And I, we, will, we will follow through with acts, you know, in, like in the drama there's act one, act two. So we will have five acts, five separate uh, um, uh, with uh, action, okay, in order that we will see, uh, we'll understand the story. Okay, the first one, Act 1, is the farewell. Act 1 is the farewell. Now, okay, verses, we start on verses 11 and 12. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And so he divided his wealth between them. Okay, so this is the starting two, uh, the starting two um, verses of, uh, the story. Now, the story that we are to 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 to, uh, to be heard or read this morning is told. Jesus told this in a different culture, different from us. Okay, sometimes uh, without the knowledge of the culture or uh, during their time, you know. Although we will. We can easily understand uh, the meaning, okay? It's, it's plain and simple, okay? Prodigal son, he comes home, the father receives him and uh, uh, have a party and celebrate, and in the same way, God will celebrate if a sinner. That, that's a message. But sometimes, digging on the culture, understanding this in the minds of the people that listening, the first-hand mindset of the people living in that culture. And sometimes we will have that real appreciation, real appreciation of what's going on, the deepness of uh, the story of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us understand that this story is about a Middle Eastern village, peasant, life during the first century. So simple uh, peasant living in a Middle East village. And we know that, uh, you know, this is like 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, no internet, no entertainment whatsoever, no transportation, no bus, no train, no airplane. Okay, there's a lot, no radio, no technology, okay? Uh, uh, that's, that's a simple life. No electricity. They don't, have, they don't need to, to worry about darkness. They have simple lamp, 
whatsoever. So that is the setting. That is the setting where this story was told. A culture that is different. A culture that is different than we are. So today we will fill up the fill up those gaps in our study of this of this story and how the people uh, will react okay, in those given situations, which includes, of course, the Pharisees and the religious prejudices during the time. Because I know that this story is really the target of the story of Jesus in Luke chapter 15, the target of the Pharisees and the scribes. Because in the first place, they are the one who murmur, who complains on what Jesus is doing, welcoming the sinners. So in answering that, he answered them with these three stories. So the main target of this story are the Pharisees, who are uh, put themselves in a pedestal that they don't, you know, they feel they don't have that responsibility to the lowest to the sinners they uh, they want those sinners to be you know uh, out of them and and through this story uh, Jesus is like saying to them that you know you are far away from the heart of God okay so uh, we see in, in, in verse uh, 11 uh, the son said, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. Now, this request, for your understanding, is disrespectful during the time. Now, maybe in our day, you go to your father, rich father, Father, give me my inheritance, okay. But during the time, during the culture, you know, when a son will do that and say that to the father, that is so disrespectful. Because only the son will inherit, will give the asset when the father dies. Okay? They have to wait for the father to die. That's why you remember one time that there is somebody is following Jesus and 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 Jesus said to him, come follow me. And the father, uh, and the, the, the man said, uh, Lord, uh, let me bury my father and then I will follow you. It doesn't mean, you know, and then Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Jesus say, for you, follow me. Don't worry about the dead. Don't worry about your father. Uh, sometimes if you will just read it plainly, like that Jesus has no consideration na matay na nga, bakit makikiramay lang yung ibig nila. But in reality, the father had not yet died. Okay? It means to say, uh, it is expected maybe that person is the firstborn because it is the responsibility of the firstborn to take care of the parents until they die. In return, the firstborn will receive two uh, uh, double portion of the inheritance. It means to say, he will only have that double portion the moment the father died. So that is their culture, that is their tradition. You cannot have anything until your father died. So you see, when the son said, uh, went to the father and said, give me my inheritance, that's disrespectful. You know, and see the ethical issue. What is in the mind of the people? What is the right thing to do? If you're the father, what's the right thing to do? The right thing to do, according to the culture, is what? Sampalin mo. Right? You are so disrespectful. Slap him in the face. Kick him out of your house. Being a disrespectful son, you don't have a right to do that. Why? Because the son, in, in saying, he is saying to the father, Father, I wish you were dead. That is what the son is saying. I wish you were dead. You're in my way. I want what's mine, and I want them now. I don't want to wait until you die. You see? That, that's what the son is saying. So, 
what is expected of the father? If you are a normal, okay, normal father during the time, you will not grant that request. And maybe you will say, that's what you want? All right, from now on, you're out of my house. Without, you will take nothing, right? And the Pharisees will agree with that. The people will agree to that kind of respect. That's the right thing to do with a disrespectful son. But, you see, what happened? What's the father's reaction? The father granted the request. When Jesus maybe is telling this story, all the Pharisees and the what? What? Why do who in the father in his right mind will do that? Nobody. Nobody. But we see the father divide the property to his son. Well, a side note, the father can do that, okay, during his time, even he is still alive. He can do that. He can divide, okay, the property to uh, his uh, sons to his children of course the uh, uh, the firstborn will receive the double portion and all the rest uh, their sons but though the father can do that divide the property they cannot have total possession of the property okay this is your portion okay but you have to wait until I die Okay, I will give you the management of it. Okay, they can assign the, his uh, children to their properties, to their businesses, whatsoever. But still, the father is the CEO. He is still in control. You understand? He is still in control, so he can do that. You have no; they cannot have a total control, though it is theirs. Now, the son is saying. I don't want to wait. <laughs> and I don't want even to manage it. Give it to me. He says, give me the share of the estate. The estate means the goods, the property that belongs to me. He didn't want to take over his inheritance and begin to develop it and use it for the good of the family. He don't want to do that. He wanted cash right now. I want the goods, I want the property, I want it now. I want no future with this family. I'm not asking you to let me manage what is rightfully mine and would be mine at your death. Just give it to me now. That's it, we're done. Napaka disrespectful, you see? That is so disrespectful. And the father obliged, granted the request, so he divided his wealth between them. The father, in doing that, did a shameful thing to himself. He did a shameful thing to himself. The father should protect his honor. He should do what is supposed to be done with a disrespectful and rebellious son. Not only, we can see not only that here in this story, not only that the son has made a shameful, disrespectful request, but the father also himself act in a shameful, disrespectful way toward himself. Now, during this time, we have not read about the older son. Where is the older son? The older son should be intervened there and will protect also his, his responsibility to protect the honor of the father and maybe falsify the other younger son. But you see, the older son is nowhere to be found. <laughs> Where is he? Where is he? It's nothing to be done. Maybe, you see, we see maybe this family is a dysfunctional family, divided. They don't have love with each other. The, 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 the son don't love his father. The older son don't love his father. The older son don't love his younger son. 
And this is the picture here. We see the older sons just show up at the end of the story. <laughs> at the end of the story, when there is already a celebration when the son. Some of the, these people, the Pharisees may in their mind will say, well, where is the older brother here? It is his duty to preserve the father's honor. If the father doesn't protect his honor himself, they, the, the son, the other son, should do that. It is his duty. In fact, uh, uh, it is their tradition, it is the first born responsibility to take care of the parents until they die. That is includes his honor. Okay, so we see the rebellion of the son. It is a total rebellion. And it says, not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together. So in other words, this is in a few days. It, it, not even maybe a week. In a few days, the youngest son gathered everything together. Uh, the, the, the Greek uh, word that was used there in this uh, phrase, it simply means he, when he received his inheritance, he turned it into cash. Okay? So it means to say, he put his property on sale. And in a few days, how come it's in a few days it's already turned into cash. You know, the son is so desperate to have the cash. So in order to have the buyers, to his buyers is to put uh, the property into the market with the less value. Okay? It's a bit of a murang mura that everybody, wow, that's so uh, like a giveaway, right away. Now, there's another, uh, uh, things that we are to understand that if you're a buyer of the property, you cannot have the total possession yet of the property because technically it's still the father is in control because he's, he's still alive. So it means to say you buy it now, but you have it later when the father died. Okay? So it means to say they have to wait still until the father's, but if it is on sale a third of the price, <laughs> why not? It's an investment. Maybe the father is old, not a few years, so you will have a great profit when the father dies. So that's the reason why in a few days later, the younger son has the cash and he goes Two, he says, he, he journeyed into a distant country. So it means to say, nagibambayan siya. He went out. He went abroad. Okay? He went abroad. That is the whole point. That's the whole point of the rebellion of the son. He wants to go as far as he can away from home. Away from accountability. Away from the rules of the father, away from his family, he went it only by his own, living by his own, get out, that he can accept, that is what exactly he won. By the way, as a footnote, when that son happens, the rebellious son happens, the, 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 uh, the thing that the son did, is considered, you know, uh, uh, responsible. So you know what the family will do? They will have a funeral right away. After the son left, they have a funeral considering the son already dead. And we read that twice in verse 24 and in verse 32, that the father said, the son of mine who was dead because they have already a funeral. Okay. So another thing that they make funeral when a Jewish man married a Gentile, they will have also a funeral. As when, when the uh, Jewish man and the uh, Gentile woman have a wedding ceremony, the family will have a funeral service. 
considering that he is already dead. So this is part of their tradition. So a son, a rebellious son, they consider him <coughs> dead. Okay, we are now in the... All right, that's one. Act two, we are now in act two. Okay, the second part of the story, the lavish life. Thirteen B. And when and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Okay, so as you say, he lived as like a prodigal. That's where the word prodigal came from. It means a waste. He lived a wasteful life. He scatters his future and ha has nothing. It means to say he just spent it all. He don't invest it into business. He spent it all. He called people to be his friends and have party. Spend, you know, with his living. And later on in the story, the older brother in verse 30 points out that he wasted a lot out on it on prostitutes. Okay, means that's a lavish life. That's a responsible life. And then uh, verse 14, what happened is now when he had spent everything, of course, if you have not invested your money to something that it will have, you know, a business, and you spend and spend, you will find yourself one day broke. And that happens. Verse 14 says, now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred on that country, and he began to impoverize. So when spent everything, Okay, he's nothing now, no, but nothing left in his pocket. And so what happened? There's a severe famine, and he began to learn that he has no money to buy food. You know, mm -hmm. even the friends, no friends that can give him. And uh, when the famine happened, you can, you know, you can read what happened, you know. When there's famine, the scarcity of food, there's nothing to buy. Even maybe if you have money, you cannot buy anything. And history, in ancient history, when there's famine, people eat garbage. They eat even their sandals. And even they eat stray animals just to survive. And Verse 15, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Again, when the people of his day heard this, remember, he's a Jewish boy. He's Jew. And one of, you know, a, a if. They don't want, they are not eating pork, you know. They don't even go near to the pigs, touch the pigs, because pigs and swine are considered unclean. Now, in the story, we see that uh, when he hired himself to a citizen of the country, he was sent to the pigs. <laughs> you see, uh, in the mind, as we are saying, uh, even from the beginning of the story of Jesus, uh, Jesus is already implicating uh, uh, the Pharisees in the scribe because we know that these people don't want even to touch it, but they don't want to pollute their minds either of the unclean. They don't want to think anything that is unclean, even in their mind. And we see that Jesus is already uh, uh, polluting their minds. Because in the first two, although the Pharisees are not included in the story, but he, Jesus is saying, if you were a shepherd, and we don't know, and they don't want that. They don't want even to think that they are shepherds because shepherds are unclean. And then secondly, if you are a woman, 
<laughs> and that's a big no for the Pharisees. Because every day their prayer is, thank God I'm not a woman. They don't want even to think of that. And now here Jesus is again polluting their mind. Now here's a Jewish boy feeding the swine. And he says, nakikipag-agawan pa ng pagkain, ng baboy. Hindi lang, uh, hindi yung baboy ang kinakain niya, <laughs> kanin baboy. <laughs> He's not even uh, eating the pig, <laughs> but he is eating with the pig. And he is fighting the, for the food of the pig. He's, he's longing to fill his stomach with the pies that the swine were eating. This is how desperate and hungry this young boy is. And in the middle, in the middle of that uh, situation, we go now to up. Okay, up three is the path to return home. Verse 17, and when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. This is a picture of true repentance. The, the young, the, the, the rebellious son realized what he did. He says, he says that, but when he came to his senses, he has thought, he think that what he did is irresponsible. What he did, so rebellious. And he said, how many of my father's hired men had more than enough bread? He remember the generosity of his father to the hard men. The hard, the, the, the hard men here are not the employees. These are like a, 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 a day laborer. You should say you hire them for a day and then pay them at the end of the day. You know, like when you go to uh, 69, you know, the people, that's the picture. Those are the hired men of these people during the time. You will go to the streets and the people who wants to work, uh, give them work in the field or whatever in your house, at the end of the day you give them the share. And he says here that uh, many that his father hired in the field, hired, he says more than enough. So his father is generous, he's generous. So he said in verse 18, and 19, I will get up and go to my father. So this is now the start of his returning home. The start of his repentance. He realized what he did. He will go to his father and will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And in your sight, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired Man. So he, he didn't even think to return to his father to be received as one of the sons. He is saying, contento na ako, I am contented if you will hire me, you know, not even a regular employee, just a hired man. Pay me day to day. So he, he didn't expect, you see, he didn't expect, of course, who will expect? <laughs> okay, again, to the, to the mind of his hearers, Jesus is telling the story, okay, that's the right thing to do. That's what you get, you rebellious son. Yeah, you can come back, but that, don't expect that your father will welcome you. And what's the, father, the, the son's expectation? Just make me one of your hired men. So he, rehears, so he, he rehearsed this to his 
uh, what he will say to his father. He says, he, I, I sinned against heaven and to you. So he thought of returning to his father. Work hard. Now, if he wants to be uh, part of the family again, okay? Granting that he wants to be part of the family again, he has to work hard and pay a restitution. Pay a price. I don't know how long he can do that. With nothing. Start from scratch. <laughs> it may be the whole of his life. He will work hard. So that is it. that's the expectation. That's what is the predicament of this young boy. Now we go now to Act number four, in verses fifteen to twenty. Um, uh, verses twenty, twenty-four. This is the <coughs> reunion. Verse twenty. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, that's not the, expect, the, the, the expected reaction of the father to a coming home of a rebellious son. That's not. Okay? That's not. The father may stay in the room as the son comes home and knock on the door or maybe tell the servants I'm here, you know, I want to see my father and I want to ask forgiveness. You know, what the reaction should be of the father? The father will, you know, stay in the room and, you know, and let the son wait outside the house which the whole village will watch and see. So in other words, as the sun is waiting outside, we don't know how many days, he will be subjected to shameful scorn, to abuse, to slander, to gossip, to the mocking of everybody in the village. That is expected. This is what he expects. That the, village, that the village response. This should be what the story is all about. Sometimes you are watching a telenovela and you have an expectation and sometimes, why? Why did he do that? He should not, he should not do that, right? There's a twist. So in the mind of the hearers during the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, expecting that he will be subjected to shameful scorn. People in the village, will laugh up at him, especially, he will not go there, you know, as though, you know, like uh, those who come from abroad, like for example, you come here in America and went home to, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the Philippines, you know, you dress good and the people will really uh, uh, recognize you. Even you don't uh, say that you come from abroad, people will, will look at you Wow, looks like come from abroad, right? But here, this is son. This is not uh, uh, you expected the son. He's he's a beggar. He's you know he he, he was a filthy, uh, uh, filthy and, and 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 ragged clothes. Remember, he's he came from the swine uh, pit. He not only looked like. A beggar, but he smell like a pig, like a manure. And because of that, people will laugh and, and he will be subjected. Maybe the, their family is one of the richest in the village. But now the son's coming home with that. You, you expect. And we see, it is also expected if the father choose to open the door, the son will bow low and kiss the father's feet. Okay? That's the thing. If the father will open and let the son see him, 
the son will bow or kiss the father's feet. But we see it didn't happen. That's the expectation. That's what the hearers expect that will happen in the story. But this doesn't happen. Let's see what happened. The father saw him. He's still out there. Not even in the village. How come? Maybe every day the father is in his balcony looking to the distant, expecting the return of his son. Maybe it is his custom every day to look. Is my son coming home? Is my son over there? Because it says in the story, when even the son was not even yet in the village, he saw. And what happened? He felt compassion. The, the, the root word of compassion here is means intestine, bowels, or abdomen. So it means to say, when he saw, when the father saw the son, how, you know, maybe the clothes or whatever, when he saw the son, he felt compassion, means to say, he felt sick in his stomach when he saw the boy and knew he was headed toward the shameful scorn of the people of the village. So what happened? So he ran towards the son. The word run there is a technical word which means racing into the stadium. So it's not just run. It's really like a, uh, a, a sprinter. You see how, how it happened. Now, you may be here. He's, is he excited? I don't think so. You know why the father do that? He don't want his son to be subjected with the shameful scorn of the village before entering the village. He wants to protect his son. Friends, what a love. When I read that, when I see that, understanding that in their culture, wow. Even if you are a rebellious son and you have that intention of returning to the father, the Father will still protect you. And one thing that I want you to know during their time, in their culture, Middle Eastern noble men don't run. So no, no. They don't run. Why? Because they wear robes, long robes, right? You see, the Middle Eastern people, they wore robes. So you cannot run. In order to run, what will you do? If you have a long road, you will put it up, of course. And, and, and the, the verb that says running is sprinting. You cannot sprint with a long road. You have really to, to put it up, show your legs, and run. According to Kenneth Daly, who is study the culture of the Middle East during the time. And he lived there for many, many years. He said that the main reasons why Middle Eastern noblemen traditionally wore long robes, which is also true with men and women, because no one can run in a long robe without taking it up into his or her hand. And because it takes up his robe, that exposes the legs. It's one thing. Exposing the legs in public is shameful. That's a no, no. You don't do that in public. And he even says in the study of the Sabbath, when it's Sabbath, okay, so Man has wear if a bird come inside your room, 
and it is Sabbath, you are not permitted to take out the bird. What is you should do, you should just sit in one place. We don't know what the bird will do that inside the room. They don't have breath yet. <laughs> just on a plain long road. So it is Sabbath. So they have to wait and sit until sundown. And then they can take out the bird. That's how it is. It is shameful. Maybe in our days it, it looked like running in public with your bricks only. You will not do that. Running on the streets with just a brick? No. It's shameful. People will laugh at you. And this is exactly what the father did. He ran. In other words, he put up his robe and ran. He put on him shame, the shame. He put on himself the shame in order to protect the son. Friends, that is what our God did. He put into himself the shame in order to redeem us from all our sins. In fact, those robes that the noblemen wear means honor. The robes bring honor. Their honor is connected with the robe. In fact, the Arabic translation of the New Testament, when they have uh, uh, because not only the Jewish part but the Middle Eastern culture the robe is important a nobleman don't run when they trans when the Arabs the Arab Christians translated uh, the New Testament into Arabic it was not translated that the father ran it was translated that he went he presented himself, he hastened, and he hurried. He don't want to mention that the father ran, even in the translation. Because for them, if the father represented God, they don't want to put God in shame, in a shameful condition. That's why he don't, they don't want to translate, to put that word run. For 1,000 years, of the Arabic translation of this account, a whole range of such phrase was no place that you can read. Uh, you can uh, read run. It is only in 1860, in what's called the Van Dyke Arabic Bible, finally in the Arabic translation, you can read that the father ran. 1,000 years, they don't want to mention, to even put that in the translation. But they cannot get away. That's what the original Greek says. The father ran. And the worksheets, you know, when the translators translate the Bible, they have different worksheets, you know, different uh, uh, words to choose from. And most of the worksheets on that translation, they translate Harry. Only on the last worksheet did they take it, he ran. He ran. You see, God took the shame for us if we will come back. And he kissed him Tandaan nyo, amoy baboy pa siya. She's, the smell, smell like pigs. But it says, the father kissed him. You know the word kiss? It's not just one kiss. The word is katafileo, means he kissed repeatedly. He kissed him on the, the, on the cheek, on the neck, on the, uh, on, on the, Knows every he kissed repeatedly. That's the verb says. Corner of the lips and the cheek, anywhere. And this is amazing. And you know.
know how much he, God is eager to receive a sinner who is coming back. He will run to the dirt and bear the shame. He will embrace the sinner and his strength and plant Jesus over the sinner's head. And you know, I believe when Jesus is telling this story, the Pharisees are shocked. They cannot believe the story. They cannot believe that the father of a noble status as him will do that to a rebellious son. They could not believe it. They shot. Because they thought and they, they believe and they thought that you need to work hard to receive favor and forgiveness from God. That's what they're teaching. If you want to go back to God, you have to work hard to get that favor. And you are saying to us, the Father is willing to put the shame, embrace you, and kiss you. And when the son in verse 20 even said, where's my verse? We are now on, on, on. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm lost. Okay, verse 21. The son said to him, Father, I've seen again seven in your sight. I'm in long, no longer worthy to be called your son. A true repentant heart. Compare that to verse 19. What is the rehearsal? He, he, you omit the last part, right? The last part is make me as your hired worker. He didn't see it. Why? Because the father already received him. Embrace him. Kiss him. He expects he is now no longer a hard man. He was accepted as a son. So he said, Father, I sin against you. I'm no longer called to be your son. And then, the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe. Best robe! <laughs> wow. Best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. You know what that ring is? It's a signet ring. It is a ring with the, with the seal of the family that you are legally be able to transact business in the name of the family. You see, you know, in the document, they just put that, that ring. You should say, it's authentic. That's authorized. And he giving back the authority to the son and put sandals on his feet. You know, only noblemen and rich people wore sandals during that time. Workers, ordinary men don't have sandals. Maybe that's expensive. I don't know. They don't wear sandals. And the father said, Get the fatted calf. You know what's the fatted calf? This is a veal or a cup that is reserved for a perfect celebration. Usually, that is reserved for the wedding of the older son. But here, the celebration, there will be a mega feast. And verse 24 it says, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost. And found, let us begun to marry. There's a party. This is a picture of God. God wanting sinners to come to Him with a repentant heart. Friends, we may not be like the prodigal son. Maybe you are that, that rebellious, you can say. Maybe, you know, because this is the extreme. This is so extreme. What's happening in the story is so extreme. But 
You see, this is shown if God can show mercy and give grace to the worst of sinners, how much more He can give you grace if you come to Him and repent of your sins. And God is, will be rejoicing even, He says that even one sinner come to Him. God didn't wait for the rejoicing. Many people, many sinners come to Him. No. Sometimes we are so happy. In an evangelistic, many thousands comes to repentance. But here you see that even one, even one soul come back to God and repent of his sin. Heaven is rejoicing. He is rejoicing. The repentance of sinners will lead to his full restoration. Remember, if you will repent of your sin, if you come to God, accept you are a sinner, He will receive you. And then God will be rejoicing in heavenly celebration.
Imagine this bucket of water is your financial situation. Each one of us will face different choices concerning our finances throughout our lives. Some of us may be struggling to keep our heads above water as we face debt at every turn. Others may be right on the line with no margin for error. And still others may have even managed to put some money into savings. Oftentimes we allow these financial situations to order our giving for us. We give when we have plenty, and hold back when times are tough. The book of Proverbs gives us a powerful truth when we view our giving based upon our bank statements. Proverbs 11.24 says that if we withhold what we should give, we will only suffer more want. Our first inclination when we hear this is to say that it cannot be true, that if we hang on to all our money, we will have that much more money to pay our bills. But the Bible doesn't concede this point. In fact, it tells us that only when we give freely, not hoarding our money, will we grow richer. By giving, we will end up with plenty, and if we try and keep it all, we end up not having what we need. What a paradox, and what a powerful motivation to give at the same time. Do you trust this promise? Do you believe that God rewards those who give in any circumstance? This is the one area where God tells us to test Him, and it's the one area very few of us actually do. We test his mercy as we run off like the prodigal son, only to find that he welcomes us back with open arms when we repent. And we are willing to test his patience with our habitual sins, again to find that he is slow to anger. So why not test his generosity and see if he does not fulfill our every need just as he promises? touching message I like it and to those who uh, send your um, uh, the offering and, offering. and tithes thank you po in advance and those who are still sending God bless you po thank you po and uh, those who are, who's, those who send this offering 10% po nyan is going to our mission which we always do, no? Yes, we always do that. So Amen. thank you, Paul, in advance. And uh, we will give you uh, um, the details. You can send uh, QuickPay or Zelle to our email address. It's gracegospelmissionsny at gmail.com or you can send your checks to P.O. Box 20775 Floral Park, New York. One one zero zero two. Yes. Yon. Amen. Ha, haba pa lang. Haba. Yes. Kung sa mare. Tingka sa camera kapatid. Speechless. <laughs> Speechless. Amen. Uh, thank you so much, Pastor Joel. It was a very very touching. Yes. You know, message, especially towards the end. I hold my tears. Yeah, towards the end, ako <laughs> din eh. You know, that's how the, I type in. That's how the Lord. That's how much God loves yes, us. Yes, thank you. Yes, kahit thank na you, yung, Pastor. Kahit na yung we are puno puno tayo ng filthiness, you know, di ba? Pero pag sinalubong tayo ng Panginoon, once we go to the Lord, sa salubongin niya tayo and yayapusin niya tayo. Amen. I was so touched, and then I just I need to hold my tears yeah, because I need to I need to operate the computer. And we <laughs> and we should have that very ano talaga yung yung uh, yung heart na talagang gusto na magsurrender sa Panginoon. Amen. I like that. Yeah. What can you say, Ray? <laughs> So, wag mo nang tanongin muna si Rene, hiya pa siya. I know. He's Masasana, very shy. Masasana, yes. Yes. Anyway, thank you so much for that. And I, I pray that the Lord touch those hearts na willing na mag-surrender sa Panginoon. Kaya alam, meron pa sa mga reservations yes. or they don't know how to do it. You know what? Very simple. Just pray a simple prayer that and raise your hands. You know, Lord, I want to surrender my life. And yes. 
thank you because I know you will welcome me in your kingdom, yes. in your family. Do it now. now. As in now na. Yes. Because we don't makita. know. We don't know what will happen next. Yes. Today, tonight, tomorrow. Yes. yes. That's very important. So before it's now. too late. Yes, before yes. it's too late. Mm-hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so uh, si Ray dito ay talagang gusto gusto na bumunot. <laughs> Teka muna. <laughs> gusto niya nang bumunot at umuwi. Oh, ma, ka po. eh ganyan talaga <laughs> harap ka sa camera paminsan-minsan. Yes. Okay, we have here the names of those people who ano who shared our uh, our today's ano church Amen. service. And we want to thank you everyone for those people who don't get tired or tired of sharing sa kanilang Amen. friends and family because they want the love of God they want the revelation of God to be heard by them also so thank you so much God bless you yes and I want to acknowledge brother Gio diba ay oo kanina we welcome ko yan I know oo. right <laughs> so I, I, I we, we like to thank Gio because Yay! yes yeah. give us ano Yoo-hoo! support yes thank you thank you Gio. Gio yes I know uh, he will be from time to time, right? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Papaalam tayo kay ano? Oh, Lem. oh, oh. At saka na-miss natin Lem, si Lem. Lem, oh, oh. Lem, pag hindi ka pa umaalis sa New York, visit ka rin sa, ano, sa atin. Yes. Okay, from visit, time visit to time. Yes. yes. And today, for those who shared, meron tayong one for women, for woman, one for men, <laughs> for man. <laughs> one for the lady and one for the gent. Yes. So, so, we will give to to giveaways. Yes, wow! Yes, yes, yes. Wow, talaga namang napaka-generous ng Grace Gospel Missions and why? Yeah, hindi lang yan kasi natutuwa tayo talaga Amen, sa mga nag-share. Yes. Si Ray, gusto nang tumakbo eh. Hindi pwede, pa. Oh, ready ka na, Ray. Pwede ka na bang ano, okay, mag-draw? Okay. okay. Sige, Kuya Ray. Sige na. Yes! Sino kaya? Ang una. Nagugi. Pakita oh, ba, it's a gent. It's a gent. Sino siya? Ang labo. Malabo ba? Si Kit! Si Kit! Yay! <laughs> kit, 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 Kit! Thank okay. you, Kit! Thank you, Kit! Kit. Congrats! You're gonna have this Kit. Ayan. Three months kang magbabasa <laughs> na. Yeah, inspiration every day. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Kit, yes, for thank sharing. Thank you, Kit. And one for, one for ano? One for the lady. lady. Yes. Sino kaya yan? Makadikit na madikit. Ibae ba yan? Ay, Ay, hindi. Lalaki yan eh. Okay, we have Cheryl, Cheryl uh, Gargulo, Gargulio. So, Cheryl, yes, uh, anohan mo ako, uh, i-contact mo ako, PM mo ako, so I can send you this, okay? Amen. Congratula- congratulations, Cheryl. There you go, this is for you. Yes, wow, right. ganda pala okay. pagka medyo focus. No? Basta focus, ano, ganyan, <laughs> yeah. For you, Cheryl. Thank you for tuning in Ray, with us. Ray, ano? Ano mo sasabi mo before you go? Ano? Sige na, huwag ka naman yan. Ano mo sasabi mo? <laughs> mahal na mahal mo si Jesus, right? Okay. Hindi impromptu si nga naman eh. Impromptu. Next time, okay. we will give him a assignment. Yeah, thank you, Ray. And uh, <laughs> it's our prayer that God will always and continue to bless Ray. Yes. Okay, thank you, Ray. Being with us every ano eh. With us every Sunday to help yes. us. Thank you, Kuya thank Ray. Thank you. God bless. Naya si Ray. Naya oh, yes, mag-ano na tayo ng mabilis ating uh, announcement. Ang ating announcement is from Monday to Friday. Don't forget 6 a.m. to 7, o- uh, 7 a.m. We have uh, Morning Bread with Pastor Joel, Pastor Mel, Sister Mel, and Sister Tess. 7 o'clock uh, 6 to 6.30 followed by Morning Prayer po. Na, na, pwede po kayo mag-join uh, They are uh, doing it by Zoom Tuesday Tuesday We have uh, Destiny Yeah, nag-start Live class also And live, live start class. na tayo And yes. for those uh, brothers and sisters who joined Meron, pa tayo, meron na po tayong mga homework Yes, so, may mga homework na ka- kami Yeah, yung mga hindi pa nakaka-join sa live class I think they had a problem So Pastor Joel will take care of it Oh, Cheryl is from Hong oh, Kong. Oh, from Hong Kong. Okay, yes. why not? Oh, ganda sa Hong Kong. <laughs> I Thank know. you, Cheryl. And then after that, Wednesday, Wednesday we have a Bible study with Pastor Joel and Sister Mel that will be 8:30 p.m. onwards. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody's joining and, us. Yes, a lot of people, a lot of us are joining us. it. Thank you so much. Thank Someone you, Paul. 
And yes. Ayun na ba? Ayun na ba? Saturday, Saturday, we usually have our practice. So, those yes. people who are interested interested of joining the music team, contact lang po si Tessie yes. si or Enya Martia. Kung yung may golden voice dyan at yes. marunong sa mga instruments, instruments you we are welcome very welcome. You. Yes, yes. And then, to kailangan, today. Kailangan din natin ng cook. <laughs> you know, yung mga gusto pong uh, magkaroon ng ministry to sa kitchen, Uh, welcome din po kayo kasi yes. nagpapakain po kami, nag-entertain po kami ng mga uh, people in the house. Mm-hmm. Na sometimes, eh, wala pa po silang breakfast, nandito na sila. Yes, thank to, you. Uh, thank you sa ating, uh, work, uh, sa ating uh, workers. Ministry. Yes. And yes. then, t- today po, 3 p.m., we have live po sa ating uh, in, per- in person sa... Sa, ano ba yun? Amazing Grace Amazing Restaurant. Amazing Grace Restaurant. Second floor. Yes. At 3.30. 3. 3 o'clock. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you are welcome po, but then we are still, um, we are have still to, uh, doing comply. the mask, yeah. we have your to, safety yeah, procedure. Yeah, so yeah. you are welcome you to, to join us that. po. 3.30, we'll start po ang aming service. So in person, if you'd like to worship uh, together with, with us, us so come you're join welcome. us. And you are welcome. Okay. Great. Ati yes. Ann, batiin ko nanay ko sa Maryland. Yes. Kasi lagi nanonood yun. Hello, Panay. All right. All right. I think we're uh, ready to say Shalom. <laughs> Sige po, uh, tayo po'y magkaroon ng blessed week at tayo po'y maging productive. Hindi lang po dahil sa ating trabaho at pa- pati kay Lord. Amen. So, Enjoy bye. the rest of your Sunday. Yes. Shalom.